We left off the other day. I think it was in those in uh, around pages fourteen and fifteen, um, talking about knowing who you are and all that kind of stuff. And Mr. Vane, you know, wants to get back home, and the Raven is kind of saying you can't. Get home until you know who you are, and you can't know who you are until you do something. So I'm, we're going to move up a little bit. Um, and pages 20, 21, Mr. Vane sees the raven pick worms up out of the ground. They're back, they're back at his home, and he digs his beak down into the earth, grabs a worm, throws it up into the air, and it turns into a butterfly. And he continues doing this. And pages 20 and 21, um, Mr. Vane says right about in the middle of page 20, no creature should be allowed to forget what and where it came from. All right? Why, says Mr. Raven. Because it will grow proud and cease to recognize its superiors. No man knows it when he is making an idiot of himself. Okay? Notice between the, because it will grow proud and cease to recognize its superiors, and the next thing in quotation marks, where do the worms come from, said the raven, you get that no man knows it when he is making an idiot of himself. That's the narrator, Mr. Vane, talking about himself. He's saying... I didn't realize it, but I'm an ass. I'm, I'm just a moron, okay? So, Raven asks, where do the worms come from? And Mr. Vane said, well, from the earth, etc. And they continue talking, and um, Mr. Uh, Vane says, you see what comes of making creatures forget their origin, okay? Because he's talking about them turning into butterflies and stuff. The raven says, it is well, surely, if it be, that is, it is right, it is proper, it is fitting for a creature to forget its origin, what, if it be to rise higher and grow larger. What's he talking about? What's the origin of the butterflies that are now flying around? They were worms, right? What has happened between being worms and becoming butterflies? Evolution. Okay, evolution. What's another <clears throat> phrase we still use to describe what happens to a caterpillar before it turns into a butterfly? Or mo it's metamorphosis, right? Metamorphosis. Easier, more English word, transformation. Okay, it's a rising up evolution, going from a lower state to a higher state. Why should something in a higher state Remember what it was in its lower state, if its lower state wasn't its ultimate state. That is, what it is supposed to be. All right. Would you have the air full of worms? Are they worms? No, they're butterflies. That is the business of a sexton. What is a sexton? We, we seldom hear or use this word in modern American English. A sexton is the person in charge of kind of maintaining a church, okay? Keeping the grounds clean, keeping the cemetery, if there is one, properly mowed, the graves kept, etc. That's the business of a sexton. What is? To have the air full of worms? What are the worms? Are they really just worms? Are they butterflies? Are they really just worms and butterflies? Or is this symbolic of something? It is definitely symbolic. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that later. If only the rest of the clergy understood it as well. What does he mean, the rest of the clergy? The clergy of a church. See, the sexton isn't necessarily the preacher or the priest. The clergy are. So what's the business of clergy? What's the business of a preacher, a minister? What is that person supposed to be doing for the congregation or 
maybe a better way of putting it, to the congregation. How? Saving them, Rashid said. What does that process saving involve? Interpreting. Interpreting? Maybe taking from worms to butterflies? Transformation? Okay. There's a phrase that St. Paul loves to use in the Old Testament. The old Adam and the new Adam. What's the old Adam? Okay, it could be the one in Genesis. It could also be what? The worm-like state of individuals. The new Adam is the butterfly-like state. Okay. It's the transformed. It's the quote-unquote Christianized in the Christian tradition. All right? So, he says, it's the business of a sexton to take care of the worms, and it's the business of the clergy to do what? To turn them into something else. All right? Vane looks behind and he suddenly realizes he's not in Scotland anymore. He thought he was safe. He thought he was home. So, he says, you, you don't have a right to do this. I'm a free being. I have free will. I have free choice. And the raven says, when you have a will, you will find that no one can do things against your will. If you were an individual, because Vane stresses his individuality, if you were an individual, I could not. Therefore, now I do not. You are but beginning to become an individual. What does it mean to be an individual? It means to know really who you are. There's a passage in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. In, um, yeah, Fellowship of the Ring. Frodo and his friends, Mary, Sam, and Pippin, Meet up with Tom Bombadil, okay? They meet up with Tom Bombadil. And there's a scene where they're talking with Tom Bombadil. And he's talking. And he's talking about things that happened thousands of years ago. Okay? And Frodo's kind of like, who are you? In other words... You're not just some crazy old guy who walks around in the forest singing silly songs. Who are you really? And Tom Bombadil kind of goes, eh, what's that? Who are you really? And then he asks him, who are you alone by yourself, nameless? What does that mean, nameless? Obviously, to be without a name. But every person in here has a name, right? When did you get it? At birth or shortly thereafter. <clears throat> so he's saying, who are you alone? That is not in connection with anybody else. Who are you by yourself, totally cut off? Who are you nameless? That is without having anybody to name you. Well, I think Tolkien's point is Frodo, Sam, Mary, Pippin, and everybody else, nobody is any of this. Nobody is alone. Nobody is by him or herself. Nobody is nameless. Why? Because every person in this room descends and depends from somebody else. Okay? Okay? Our parents. Whether we know them or not, whether they are biological parents or not, we descend from them and we depend. What does that word depend mean? Especially this part. Because some of you wear pendants around your neck. Like a cross or something else. What is that? Why is that thing called a pendant? Because it is hanging. Okay? To depend means you essentially hang from. We 
hang from those who came before us. Our parents hang from the parents who came before them, parents who came before them, and you could trace that family tree all the way back to where, you know, in an evolutionary context, the first modern humans. In a mythological context, Adam and Eve. Okay? So none of us can fit any of these. What Tom Bombadil is getting at is, I can. <laughs> My reading of Tom Bombadil is he's essentially saying, I am a manifestation of Iru Luvatar, God. I don't know that that's one hundred. I don't know that that's right. I think it's right. Okay. So when we hear, I lost my place. What he said about being an individual, he's getting at this idea: you can't be one until something happens. You can't be an individual. You can't really know yourself until something happens. Well, that something isn't going to happen until much, much later in the book. Okay, so, um, go on, it's the bottom of the next page, 23, that he talks about having never yet done anything to justify, justify my existence, what I was talking about the other day, about doing something so that the world knows you actually lived, okay, the, the existential idea about validating your existence, authenticating your existence, authenticating, A-U-T-H-E-N-T-I-C-A-T-E. -E. Notice, what's the root of that? It's this. What word do we get that's related to that? Author. To be the author of your existence. How do you do that? You act. According to the existentialist, as I said the other day, it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as you make the world know you exist. You could be the holiest, saintliest, most helpful person in the world, or you could be the dirtiest, rottenest bastard that ever lived. Either way, the world's going to know you existed. Okay? You authored your reality, so to speak. Okay? So, skip a few pages and go on to... Skip that passage. The Sexton's Cottage, Chapter 6. The raven takes Mr. Bain to his cottage. His, the raven's, not Mr. Bain's. And he meets there Mr. Raven's wife, and she asks, the bottom of page 28, Now let me back up. Raven says, here's Mr. Vane, wife. Oh, by the way. The name. How else can we spell that? What does it mean to be vain? Louder? Shallow. Shallow? What else? Carly Simon had a song in the er, very early 70s. You're so vain. Supposedly about Warren Beatty. Okay? What does she say in that song? Look it up. <clears throat> she says, everything is about you. So, a vain person is a narcissist. Narciss I hate that word. I can't remember if it's like the like narcissist, or this is what you want to do. An egotist, okay? A vain person thinks only about him or herself. All they're only concerned is, is their appearance, what other people think of them, etc., etc. Okay? Is that Mr. Vain? Is that how he is? Is that how he comes across? He does think about himself an awful lot. So, she, he hears the wife of the raven. He is welcome, she said. She answered in a low, rich, gentle voice. Treasures of immortal sound seem to lie buried in it. 
He looks at her. She stands in front of the door. And she asks, will he sleep? I fear not. He is neither weary nor heavy laden. That is a biblical illusion. Why do most people sleep? Because he's tired. What's he mean? He's not tired enough to sleep. That's the weary part. The heavy laden? Carrying a burden. Christ, Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and what? I will give you rest. Notice her first question. Will he sleep? Will he sleep? Is that rest? It can be. So, she then asks her husband, then why did you bring him? If he's not ready to sleep, why bring him here? I have my fears it may prove precipitate. That is, it may lead to something. Mr. Vane says, I'm over here, I don't understand you. What, are you. what are you talking about? The woman says, he has not yet learned that the day begins with sleep. Tell him he must rest before he can do anything. Well, there's that idea again of doing something. Now he sees Mr. Raven from the front for the first time. He sees his face. Page 29, right in the middle. I'd seen only his back before. Now, for the first time, I saw his face. It was so thin that it showed the shape of the bones under it, suggesting the skulls his last claim profession must have made him familiar with. Sexton is also the person who does the burying, a grave digger. Okay? So he's saying, this guy looks like what he's used to putting in the ground. But in truth, I'd never, never before seen a face so alive or a look so keen or so friendly as that in his pale blue eyes, which yet had a haze about them, as if they had done much weeping. He says, you knew I wasn't a raven. I knew you were Mr. Raven, but I thought you were a bird, too. All right, so they talk about that. Did you ever see a raven do that? Do what? Pick up worms and throw them into the air? Mr. Raven asks. Does a sexton toss worms in the air and turn them into butterflies? Yes, the raven says. I never saw one do it, Mr. Vane says. You saw me do it, Mr. Raven says. But I'm still a librarian in your house, for I never was dismissed, never gave up the office. But you just told me you were a sexton here. I am. I'm sexton here, librarian in your office. What's he really saying? What's a librarian do? Works with books, right? Organizes them, catalogs them, etc. What does a sexton do? In terms of what he's been talking about, organizes bodies, buries them, catalogs them, you know, here lies. Books, people. Books are people, people are books, is this idea he's kind of raising. Not Particular to McDonald, Shakespeare uses the same idea. John Donne uses the same idea. Okay. So, they continue talking, and, and the sexton says, you know, we all have different selves. Sometimes you have a bird self, sometimes a beast self, sometimes a lion self, a man self. And Mr. Vane asks Mrs. Raven for something to eat because he's hungry. And she goes to a cupboard in the wall and she brings out from it bread and wine. Now, symbolism. It's the Eucharistic meal. It's communion, okay, in the Christian tradition. So, they continue talking about sleep. And he says, okay, I'll go to sleep. But you have to wake me up. And they say, no, no. We don't wake people up. They wake up on their own. And the sexton finally says, won't you trust me? Come on, just a little bit of trust. Mr. Vane, top of 32, I will. So they go into the cemetery. They walk past row upon row upon row. But it's not really a cemetery. It's more like a dormitory. And there are bodies lying on what are referred to kind of as 
couches. Not what we think of as a couch, but like a table. And here's one, and here's one, and here's one. And it's like, you know, flip the switch, and you're in a giant warehouse, like an Amazon distribution center. And there's just table after table after table with body upon body upon body lying upon it. All right? And he sees all these. And Mr. Raven describes these bodies. Top of 33. Much, much wine is set here to ripen. What's the good wine? What's good scotch? <clears throat> Stuff that's been aged. Wine that you just got off the vine, you know, a week ago. It's not going to be very good. Okay. What's he saying about these bodies? They're not decaying. They're growing better as they rest. They're, they're, you can think of them as, they're kind of like a cookie. They're like bread that, you know, the yeast has been put in the dough, and now what's happening? You're proving it. It's, you're letting it rise. All right? They keep walking along, and he sees various people. And we come at last, page 34, to three empty couches, immediately beyond which lay the form of a beautiful woman a little past the prime of life. One of her arms was outside the sheet, and her hand lay with the palm upward, in its center a dark spot. Next to her, a stalwart figure. And what does he discover? Well, one of these is his grandfather. All right. So... Mr. Vane says, page, excuse me, Mr. Raven says, page 35, none of those you see are in truth quite dead yet. Some have just begun to come alive and die. What? What do you mean some have just become, begun to come alive and die? Well, what does Christ tell his followers? What must you do? You must die and be born again. You must die, what, in order to wake. You must take up your cross and follow me. Others had begun to die, that is to come alive, long before they came to us. That is, what's he saying? They had begun to deny themselves before they came here. Meaning, kind of, before they physically died. Others hadn't, and they've got to come here, and they have to die to self in order to live. Remember when we talked the first day when we were talking about McDonald's? I talked about this idea. This is the reason he was put out of the church. Because he was a universalist. He thought ultimately everybody would be saved. Would acknowledge God, etc. Right? So, he goes on and says, but I'm not going to say any more. Why? For I find my words only mislead you. He says, I'm going to stop talking to you now, Mr. Vane, because everything I say, whoosh, right over your head. Okay? First time I read this, probably your experience, I thought, yep, whoosh, you know, so far over my head, I, you know, it might, he might as well be talking to Mount Everest. So, he's like, so, so you want me to lie down here? You want me to go to sleep here with all of these dead bodies around me? Well, sorry, mostly dead. Not quite fully dead. But you want me to go to sleep here? It's like a morgue, folks. How many, well, unless they're really sick and twisted. How many people do you know who want to go, you know, and lie down on a morgue operating table with the bodies in the, you know, drawers behind. Yeah, not many, okay? Like I said, unless they're kind of sick and twisted. So he says, I would, no, forget it. I'm not going to. He runs. He finds himself in his house again. He reads his father's manuscript. I'm skipping a bunch. And he sees Mr. Raven again. Um, and Mr. Raven tells him he's going to have to go through the evil wood. He asks, you know, where is that? Page 
pages 44 and 45. And they continue talking. Right? Mr. Vane again asks, can, can, can you show me how to get home? Mr. Raven says, there are many ways. Well, tell me the nearest. And Raven says, you know, you and I are using the same words, but it's like you're talking German and I'm talking Italian. We're not hearing each other. He says, top of 45, you and I use the same words with different meanings. We are often unable to tell people what they need to know. Why? Because they want to know something else. So if they want to know something else, what do they hear when someone tells them what they need to know? They don't. They don't hear it. Okay? Most of you probably don't have kids. Some of you might. When you do have kids, when those kids get to be teenagers, early, mid, even late teens, you will probably try to tell that child something that you believe that child needs to know. And you know what that child's going to hear? The voice in the old Charlie Brown cartoons. Wah, 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 wah. That is utter nonsense. Why? Because that child wants to hear something else. What does that child, you know, perhaps want to hear? A, an affirmation of something he or she wants to do. And your role as parent is to say, stop. <laughs> nope. Can't do it. Right? So he says, Home is ever so far away in the palm of your hand, and how to get there it is of no use to tell you. But you will get there. You must get there. You have to get there. Everybody who is not at home has to go home. What the hell is he talking about? He is not talking about a physical place. Wherever your physical address is. What does he mean, home? You know, we have a phrase. You hear it every now and then. Louder. Home is where the heart is. Exactly what I was going to say. Home is where the heart is. The only problem with that phrase, where is the heart? Okay. What is your heart's deepest desire? I mean, I, I think this is one of the deepest motivations of all literature. It's asking how to get home and where is home? Because what is home? Home is the place of acceptance. What kind of acceptance? Complete. Total. Home is the place where each individual will be completely, or is, completely, totally loved, accepted, etc. Unconditional, no matter what one has done. Obviously, what I'm talking about is not necessarily a physical place here, right? Yeah, I don't think it is. St. Augustine, the guy who wrote The City of God and a bunch of other stuff back in the 4th century, excuse me, 5th century, said, after living an early life, a pretty riotous living, I mean, he was known for being a, a, a favorite among the women of Hippo, which is the town in North Africa where he lived, and had a conversion experience, right? He said every person is born with a God-sized hole in their heart. That's this deepest desire. And he said, because every person is born with this God-sized hole in their heart, guess what every person tries to do? Plug the hole. With what? Anything. <laughs> Everything. He says, I tried to plug it with wine, women, and song. Lots of wine, lots of women, maybe not as much song. Okay. But it's 
it's God-sized or God-shaped. It can only be filled ultimately with one thing. You could jump up to the 20th century, and, you know, and it's one of the most popular songs by U2. I still haven't found what I'm searching for. The searching for, there's something missing, okay? That's kind of what Mr. Raven is getting at. Everybody who is not at home has to go home. You've got to find it. You thought you were at home when I, where I found you. That is, you thought that big old house up there in Scotland. That that was your home. No. If that had been your home, you could not have left it. What? He's saying home. Hey there. If it's your real home, you can never leave it. Why? Well, if you take the Augustinian idea, because if if you found this, guess what? Then you're always full of this. You're always at peace. You're always content. You're never out looking for something else. Okay? Mr. Vane says, Enigma treading on enigma. Put that in modern English. What the hell do you mean? I don't have a clue, he's saying. I, I didn't come here to answer riddles, but you must. <laughs> you must answer the riddles. They will go on asking themselves until you understand yourself. The universe is a riddle trying to get out, and you are holding your door hard against it. That is, the universe, he's saying, is trying to speak to you, trying to break open the door of your consciousness, and what are you doing? No. No. I refuse. We're going to meet somebody later on who will say, I refuse. All right? Will you not in pity tell me what I am to do, where I must go? Right? We all want to have that kind of direction. We all want, even though we might verbally say, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. We do want somebody to tell us what it is I must do to find what? This, maybe, happiness, success, peace, fulfillment. Because it's a lot easier to have somebody tell you what to do than it is what? You have to figure it out yourself. Every semester, you know, I'll talk first day of class about paper expectations if the class requires a paper. And I'll say, I'm not going to give you an, I'm not going to give you a topic. Part of your work as a college student is to figure out that topic on yourself. And it never fails. I'll get five or six students come up. So what are the paper topics? Like I just told you. I'm not giving them to you. What? You mean I've got to figure that out? I've got to, because that's like what? That's additional work, man. I don't want to work. I want what? I want to come. I want to listen. I want an A. <laughs> that's it not how it works. So, how should I tell your to do? That is, how should I, Mr. Raven, tell you, Chris, how you find your way? Why can't I do that? I, Mr. Let's assume I'm Mr. Raven. Why can't I do that? Or let's jump to us. Why can't I, Ted Sherman, tell any one of you how to find happiness in your life? I don't know you. And we could sit down and have a bunch of beers together and become really good friends and know each other for 20 years. And guess what? Still won't know. I still couldn't do that. Why? Because I'm not wearing your shoes. I'm not you. You are you. And only you know what shape that hole takes. Only you can find out what the jigsaw puzzle part is. Okay? That's why people will come to me and say, you know, I need your advice on something. I'll say, I'm not going to give you advice. I'll tell you what. 
if it were my situation, what I might do. But I can't say what you should do in this situation. Because I don't know your background. I don't know your values. I don't know your motivations. Blah, 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 blah. If I'm not to go home, at least direct me to some of my kind. Okay, so if you won't tell me how to get home, at least point me to where I can find other humans. I don't know of any. In other words, you're screwed. Where we are, there aren't any other of your kind. The beings most like you, notice, there aren't any other what? Use. You're the only one there, Mr. Vane. Okay. Unique and individual. We didn't talk about it much, but in Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, he mentioned, and he quoted a little passage from that poem that he wrote to C.S. Lewis. And he included the phrase, the splintered white. Right? Talking about all humanity okay, is an element of the splintered light. That is, we are elements of the white light shining through the prism. What does it do? It breaks it out into the colors of the rainbow. What's he getting at there? Well, the white light is God. So what is the splintered light? You and 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 all through everybody in this classroom, everybody in this floor, everybody in this building, everybody on this campus, everybody in this city, state, country, continent, hemisphere, world, period. His point is every person who has lived is or reflects some of that light. How does the author of the book of Genesis put it? And God made man in his image. That's it. Everybody made in the image of God. Does that mean, you know, because some people are dark skinned, some people are white skinned, some people are yellow skinned, that God is a rainbow? No, it's not talking about physical. It's talking about kind of um, will. Choice, ability, okay? Well, what else does it mean? If we take Tolkien's idea, it means, I'm going to pick on one person, it means Rashid has an element of God's light, and he's the only one that will ever, on this earth, on this planet, reflect that particular wavelength. Nobody else will ever reflect that particular wavelength. So then what does that do for the significance of Rashid for everybody else? Is he a nobody? Is he nothing? Well, if you accept that kind of cosmology that Tolkien presents, that means he dies, he gets killed, what happens to that little expression of God in our world? It is snuffed out. That's pretty powerful when you think about it. All right? McDonald is kind of dealing with the same thing. Tolkien refers to McDonald in that essay, if you remember correctly. He talks about him writing fairy tales. In the drafts of the essay, which I've held in my hands at Oxford University, he talks about this book. It doesn't get included in the final version. Right? I mean, he's borrowing some from McDonald. So, um, he goes off. And we're going to skip a bit. What time is that? It's 9.47. Uh, he goes off. He... makes his way to the evil wood and he sees these skeletons dancing and such. Right? 
Go on to, let's see, I'm going to skip a bunch that I probably shouldn't. Chapter 13, we meet for the first time the little ones. Children who don't grow older. I mean, take that back. They do grow older. They do it very, very slowly. Some of them grow up into big people. What happens to them when they become big people? They become bad. They become bad. How do, what do the children refer to the big people as? Bad giants. Bad giants. Okay. Who do we come to discover later on the leader of the little people is? Lona is her name. She's the daughter of Lilith. Adam. Okay. So, he meets the little people. The little people care for him. They feed the little ones. They feed him, etc. He gets captured by the <coughs> bad giants. And the little ones still feed him and such. What does he do for the little people in this first section where he meets with them? <coughs> How does he help them? He doesn't. He did. He does absolutely nothing for them. Okay, What could he do? We hear later on. But he's even aware of it now. What do they not have? Water. They don't have water. Is water available? Yes. Where? Under the ground. Under the ground. Because he's heard it. And if you can hear the water underground, how deep is it? You don't have to dig far to reach it. Okay? Um... So he does start to think, I, 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 should, I should do something for them. What does he think maybe he should do? Page 68. Give them knowledge. What kind of knowledge? He says towards the top of the page, of time, they had scarcely the idea. They don't have an awareness, an understanding of time. Do they know when it's morning and when it's evening? Yes, they do. Are they aware of hours, minutes, seconds? No. How useful is it to be aware of hours, minutes, seconds? Where? Here, in our world. Why? Because you have to be somewhere by certain times. You have to catch a flight by a certain time. What if you live in the kind of society, civilization, lack of a better term, they have? Do you need to know the time? No, you don't. It's completely what? Beyond your purpose. It serves nothing. What else? Of their own age, they knew nothing. Does it really matter if you're seven years old and you know you are seven? It doesn't. I was just reading something the other day. Uh, it's a little review of a new autobiography uh, biography coming out about Frederick Douglass. And... Douglas knew what year he was born in. He knew what month he was born in, but he had no idea of the date. It's February. He picked the 14th. Why? It's the exact middle of the month. He just said, I'm going to say February 14th is my birthday. Okay. Did it matter? What if he was born on the 13th? What if he was born on the 29th? Does that mean he was only one-fourth the age he actually was? So, Lona herself thought she had lived always, full of wisdom, empty of knowledge, right? Because knowledge doesn't equal wisdom. You can get all kinds of book learning and still be dumber on a rock when it comes to wisdom. Because what is wisdom? Is it the application of knowledge? Louder. It's experience, but it's what about experience? It's the lessons you learn from the life experiences. Okay. Pretty soon you learn. You bang your head up against a concrete block wall. How long does it take to learn? That hurts. For most people, once. But there are some people who do the same damn thing over and over and over. And what do they expect each time they do it? A different outcome. That's insanity. According to Einstein, that's the <laughs> definition of insanity. 
doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Okay? Knowledge, he goes on that same paragraph, says, knowledge no doubt made bad people worse. But it must make good people better. True or false? False. Why must it make good people better? Does knowing more, and this is an idea that is anathema to our society. Does knowing more make someone better than someone who knows less? No. No. Our governor thinks, hey, I'm far, far right wing politically. I mean, I'm to the right of Genghis Khan. Ronald Reagan was a leftist. I'm being facetious, but, okay. Our governor's a Republican. I think he's an idiot, personally. Because what is one thing he assumes, and by the way, I'll take shots both sides. I'm pretty fair that way. He assumes just because we have adults who have a college degree that, therefore, they will be better. work? It's not clear. One of the things I, you know, I watched Trump's State of the Union. One of the things I really loved was, in he, was when he said, we need more vocational training. What does he mean by that? We need more trade schools. We need to teach more people who want to, to become plumbers and carpenters and welders and auto mechanics. Why? Because not everybody should be here. The governor thinks, and a lot of governors think, everybody should have a college degree. Bernie Sanders wants to make it free. Hillary Clinton said she wanted to make it free. What happens when you make something free? What does it do to the value of that thing? Yeah, it makes it worth what? Nothing. Nothing. It makes it absolutely worth Zilch, which is why your bachelor's degree today. Oh, should I go there? Won't be worth it. Yeah, yeah isn't worth what? <laughs> Anything, really. 30 years ago, your bachelor's degree would have almost guaranteed you a job. But today, it's like what? It's like a high school diploma. Because you can't get an awful lot of jobs now with a high school diploma. You can't get a job as a secretary filing papers. Now, that kind of job often requires a bachelor's degree. Why? It makes absolutely no sense. Knowledge makes one better? No. Experience. That can make one better if one learns from what, if one gains wisdom from it. Okay? So, that's when he kind of lays down, puts his ear to his ground, page 69, and he hears water. And the soft noises made him groan with longing. At once I was amid a multitude of silent children, and delicious little fruits began to visit my lips. They came and went until his thirst was gone. But he still hears this water. The children talk to him about the cat woman. Page 71. Lona says, don't fear her. She won't hurt you. Okay? And he's still thinking about something he could do to help the children. How were they to grow? Tolkien, in the fairy story essay, what does he say about children? They are meant to grow up. Not to become Peter Pan's. Peter Pan refuses to grow up, right? Right? Why? Doesn't want to take on responsibility. Okay? Children are meant to grow up. So, how are they going to? But then again, he asks, why? Why should they? Why can't they stay how they are? In seeking to improve their conditions, might I not do them harm and only harm? Finally, he asks the question far too many of our scientists don't ask. <laughs> I can do this. Should I do this? Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park. 
Read the novel if you've never read it. The novel's a hundred times better than the book. Because Crichton was a, I'll call it quasi, quasi-scientist. He was a medical doctor. So he's a scientific thinker. But he asks a whole lot more questions in the novel than come out in the book. But one of those central questions is, okay, we have the ability to do something. Does that mean we should do it? Robert J. Oppenheimer and, you know, Teller et al., Fermi and all those guys back in the Manhattan Project, they knew we could build this thing. They didn't ask, should we? So that when they detonated the first atomic bomb at, where was it, Alamo? Alamogordo or wherever it was, what did Oppenheimer say? He saw that explosion, and he knew two things. The genie will never go back in the bottle. We will never unlearn how to do this. And he said, I am become the destroyer of worlds. He knew at that moment, this is hell unleashed. All right? To enlarge their minds after the notions of my world, might it not be to distort and weaken them? Their fear of growth, as a possible start for gianthood, might be instinctive. And then he makes this kind of general statement. The part of philanthropist is indeed a dangerous one. Philanthropist. The word literally means lover of mankind. What does it mean in our society, though? Someone who wants to do good, right? The Gates Foundation. Gives off billions of dollars a year to do what? To ease the plight of humanity. To make the world a better place. Right? The part of philanthropist is indeed a dangerous one. The man who would do his neighbor good must first study how not to do him evil. Why? Because what law is always in effect? Let's not apply it to philanthropists for a moment. Let's apply it to Congress in passing laws. The law of unintended consequences. You think you're doing something, but what are you not looking at? Not the immediate response, but maybe what happens two, three, four steps down the road. Right? The difference between, you know, it's the old Asian adage. You meet somebody who's starving. What can you do? You can give a man a fish, or you can teach a man to fish. You give a man a fish, he's going to be hungry tomorrow. Teach a man to fish, he'll be able to feed himself the rest of his life. So does that mean, according to that adage, you see somebody homeless on the street, they ask for money, you say, no, 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 you should get a job. What does that do for that person in that situation right now? Where that person is hungry. You want to end world hunger? Feed the hungry person you meet. Don't worry about the hungry person over in another continent. You want to do something about racism? Love the people you meet. Don't worry about somebody else not loving somebody else. You want to do something about poverty? Help the poor you meet. Okay, what does that assume? It assumes you meet somebody who's poor. And it means it assumes you meet somebody who is not like you, that you can love, etc. These are all part of what he's talking about with this idea of philanthropy. First, study how not to do an evil, but what else? You must begin by pulling the beam. The philanthropist must begin by pulling the beam out of his own eye. Biblical illusion, right? What's the beam? Your own, faults. your own faults. The thing that obstructs your own vision. In other words, before you pull the speck of dust out of somebody else's eye, meaning, oh, you shouldn't be doing that, or criticizing, etc., what? This works. Look in the mirror. See yourself for what you are. Which is going to be Come really important later on in this novel. Okay. Um, we've got a couple.
couple more minutes. I'm going to skip a bunch. Go up to... Nah. Um, we're going to pick up on Monday, on page 86. And we got, like I said, we got to finish on Monday, so we'll just zip on along from there. Um, expect a quiz. I have no idea what, how I'll come up with a quiz, but expect one.